Welcome to this uh, uh, seminar. Um, I, I'm not really speaking, though I'm down on it. Really, uh, we're, we're um, very privileged to have Colette McCauley and Jen Hampton speaking about their work. Um, and I'll be mainly sort of chairing the session. So I just wanted to say a couple of housekeeping type things. Um, firstly, we are uh, recording this session um, and we'll be making it publicly available. Um, so um, I think people should I hope you're aware of that. Um, secondly, we're hoping people will speak for about 40 minutes or so, um, and there'll then be time for 20 minutes um, or so of questions, because um, there's quite a lot of people here. The way we manage that, as many people do, is um, you can either type your question into the chat, and we'll, I as chair or others may try to pick it up and respond to it, um, or you can put your hand up, and then once the uh, presentations are finished, we'll come to those we can and then unmute you. At the moment, everyone's muted because with so many people, um, if, you don't un if you don't mute everyone, you get all sorts of extraneous noises. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to um, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Jen Hamilton and Professor Colette McCauley. Um, Jennifer Hamilton currently works at WIZARD, which is the Welsh Institute for Social and Educational Research and Data, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, however, she's which is based at Cardiff University in the School of Sciences, Social Sciences. Um, but Jen's just about to go to a new job at the Office for National Statistics. Um, however, I think she will keep links with uh, Wizard and I hope therefore with Cascade. Um, Colette McCauley is a, a very distinguished social work professor who um, recently retired from Bradford University, is very well known for her work around child wellbeing and other areas. And I'm really delighted has, has joined Cascade as an honorary professor where she's going to lead some work we hope to do in the coming months and years, trying to develop work around child well-being. Um, just a note about the sort of title and topic, and then I'll actually hand on to the people who are going to tell you the interesting stuff. Um, we, we initially were looking specifically at a, a focus on comparing the ch children in care uh, with others in terms of well-being, and that is part of our analysis. However, we realized that um, some similar topics have been covered um, in a fairly recent um, webinar by um, Julie Selwyn. Um, so we've sort of supplemented it with Jen talking about the findings uh, around well-being internationally and in Wales uh, from the Children's World Survey, um, and Colette talking about the Children's Understanding of Well-Being study, which provides much more in-depth qualitative work, research around well-being. So I sort of feel, and I hope, that you're getting three studies in one or bits of three studies in one. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to be able to hand over to Colette, who I think is going to kick us off with a bit of background before handing over to Jen. So Colette, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see such a large audience. Um, uh, uh, I uh, Just to explain a little bit about why Jen and I are together, Donald has referred to it. Um, I came down to give an invited lecture for Cascade in February 2020, seems an age ago now, and was uh, sharing the findings of the English Children's Understanding and Wellbeing Study. And um, Jen Hampton was in the audience and told me that she had been conducting the first Welsh uh, Children's World Study on well-being, and therein started a really fruitful relationship. Um, when I came then to work as a as an honorary professor with Cascade, I recontacted Jen, and we've been involved in uh, some very interesting discussions which has led actually to two international um, uh, co-presentations and now been invited to do this presentation for uh, exchange, which we're delighted about. Um, coming from a chair of social work background, one of the first questions I asked Jen when she told me about this very successful uh, Children's World Survey of children in the general population was whether in that sample she had actually um, uh, collected any data on children in care. And of course, what we're going to talk about today is, yes, there was a small subsample of children in foster care. Um, but there's quite a bit of, I thought it might be useful today to just go back to some um, uh, background about 
uh, child wellbeing. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, I thought it might be useful. Some of you will be very immersed in the world of child well-being, but some may not be. So I just thought it might be useful to just talk about child well-being, subjective well-being and cross-national comparison. What's it all about and why does it matter as a starter before Jen goes into detail about the Children's World Survey generally? and then more specifically, the questions about how Welsh children compare with children in other countries on subjective well-being, and how do children in foster care in the Welsh sample compare with other children. Um, then I want to uh, take us into the study that Donald's referred to, which was the first UK study on children's understanding of well-being. The children's world study being quantitative, the children's understanding of well-being studies being qualitative. And that first study was carried out in England by myself. And I want to talk a little bit about the details of that study and then try to draw that together, what we've learned from both studies and where it might take us next. And we've also supplied some references and questions at the end. OK, so let's go. We've had, we've a limited time. So I wonder. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just started with this quote from UNICEF as far back as 2007. Nice quote about the true measure of a nation's standing is how well it attends to its children, their health and safety, their material security, their education and socialization, and their sense of being loved, valued, and included in the families and societies into which they're born. Child well-being as a concept has been the subject of increasing international interest over the past two decades. And myself and a colleague, Wendy Rose, that some of you may know, have been, uh, edited a whole collection of that in 2010. Traditionally, child well-being indicators were based on what we call proxy measures. In other words, it was, uh, uh, they were dependent on things like the rates of children living in poverty in a country to compare across countries. Or more recently, they have depended on the views of adults about how children see their well-being. But much more recently, especially with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and advances in the sociology of children, where we recognize the agency of children as well as their rights to express their own views, there's been a growing recognition that children need to be consulted about their own views on their well-being. So cross-national studies then on children's subjective well-being um, have grown over this last mm, 12 years at least and they have used both online surveys and qualitative methods. And the next slide, please. So in an effort to advance our understanding of children's perspectives on their well-being, the International Society of Child Indicators has supported two major international initiatives, one called the Children's World Study Quantitative Survey, and the other, the Children's Understanding of Wellbeing Qualitative Project. Both have included children from multiple developed and developing countries. And if you're interested in finding out more about the results of these uh, studies in different countries and the results of comparison, we've given you the webs, uh, website there of each. The Children's World Study um, has consistently highlighted the significant influence of relationships on children's sense of well-being. They've also noted how children in different countries may report quite different responses about where they feel safe. And overall, learning from the Children's World Study has recently been summarised. Now, the two initiatives complement each other and together provide a developing understanding of the subjective well-being of children in the general population. However, it has been recognised that it would be important to include the perspectives of children in special circumstances, such as children in state care. Let's hear more now about the Children's World Survey in general and in Wales in particular from Jen. Next slide, please. Thanks, Colette. And uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so as Colette outlined, I'm going to be talking about the Children's World Survey, giving an overview of the survey and some of the findings from the international and national work that I've conducted, and then followed by the current work that Colette and myself are doing, um, which has that focus on children in foster care. 
So Children's Worlds is an international study of children's subjective well-being that's been running since 2010. Um, it's received funding from the Jacobs Foundation, along with support from various local and national organisations. So in Wales, we received um, support from the Welsh Government, the Children's Commissioner for Wales, Cardiff University and the Economic and Social Research Council. So with each wave or sweep, um, of which there have been three, with a COVID-19 supplement currently underway, um, each of them consists of an age appropriate questionnaire. So there's three separate questionnaires, one for eight year olds, one for 10 year olds, and one for 12 year olds. Um, and these questionnaires are completed by the children themselves, um, covering a, a wide range of topics over several areas, including those that I've listed on the slide. So covering stuff from home and family, money and possessions, through relationships, their local area, school, health, um, safety time management and use and and then other questions about themselves. Um, so for today's presentation, I'm going to be concentrating on that on that third wave. So the most recent full survey, really, um, which was the first in which Wales was represented with UK data in earlier waves um, being drawn from England only. So data in the world, third wave was collected around 2017, 2018. Um, and uh, over 120,000 children from across 35 countries and four continents took part. So if we could have the next slide, please, Sean. So um, I just thought I'd visualize this. So this map shows the countries that participated in the third sweep. And as you can see, we had responses from children across Europe um, and other diverse countries across the globe. Um, participation varied between countries a little, so um, including mainly differences in which age, age groups participated. So, um, so, so for example, in England, only 10 year olds participated, whereas in Wales, we had 10 and 12 year olds. And then in other countries, they had that younger eight year old sample as well. Um, um, representative samples were sought from across all the countries, but there were there were differences in sample sizes. So England had the smallest number of children join in with 717. So still still a significant number. Um, and Indonesia just this is just a point of interest, but they had by far the largest with over 23,000 participants in their surveys. Um, next, please. Uh, slide, please. Shan. Thank you. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, the third wave was the first time that we participated in Wales. Um, data was collected through the summer term of 2018, so May to July, with recruitment of children through their schools. So, in order to attempt to obtain that representative sample that I spoke of, our sampling frame consisted of two strata. So, essentially, we had a framework where we, we specifically drew schools from um, different socioeconomic geographies at one level and then proportion of children eligible for free school meals within those schools at the other. So in terms of um, our achieved sample, so the um, children that actually participated, we successfully recruited over two and a half thousand pupils from 54 state maintained mainstream schools. Um, we collected all of the data online. Um, oh, we didn't actually, we mainly collected the data online. There were two schools where we had paper surveys. Um, but generally, these, these uh, online surveys were done in school during the school day um, with children reassured that participation was completely voluntary and they were able to skip any questions they didn't want to answer. Um, all data was collected anonymously at the pupil level, although we did keep um, school level identifiers for our research purposes. Um, and pupils were able and encouraged to answer in their preferred language, so either um, Welsh or English. So next slide, please. So. Um, before I move on to the, the analysis that we've done most recently, I'm just going to go through some of the headline results from the international comparisons to give an idea of the relative subjective well-being of children in Wales. Um, this is going to be done through a series of graphs that look like this. This is just an example, um, just to show you the, the kind of the format that we're going to be going through it in. So um, all, all of the countries are in descending order. So the higher up on the graph the country is, the better the well-being score. And the axis is crossing at the grand mean, so the average of all of the countries. Um, so if a country's bar goes to the left of this, then that country has a lower than average score. And conversely, if it goes to the right, then they have a higher than average score. I'll, um, I will talk through the slides and highlight Wales's position. Um, and I've highlighted Wales. It was pink, and that's what it says on the slide, but it's actually green on the graph. It's PowerPoint, isn't it? As soon as you put it in a different slide, it changes. 
Um, so yeah, the green bar is Wales on the graphs. And then the dotted lines represent um, confidence intervals. And so all that is, is that the other countries, the countries that have bars between those two dotted lines have um, scores that are very similar to Wales. Whereas if they're on either side of the dotted lines, then that means that their scores are, di are dissimilar to Wales. So they're significantly different. Um, so the next slide, please. I'm going to talk about three areas in the survey that cover subjective well-being. Um, the first of these is overall life satisfaction, which is a key element of understanding subjective well-being, both of children and of adults. Typically, it's measured by just one question, as, as here. Um, and ch so children were asked to respond to the question of how happy they were with their life as a whole on an 11 point scale from 0 to 10, with 0 being not happy at all and 10 being completely happy. Um, next slide, please. And so this slide shows the results from the 12 year olds in the survey. Um, and as we can see from the graph, so Wales is quite low down um, in, the, in the kind of rankings. I don't really want to use that word, but it's the easiest way to explain um, what's going on here. Um, so as we can see on the graph, children in Wales, so that green bar had significantly lower than average levels of life satisfaction. Um, and, and it's not represented here, but within Wales, the older children, so these 12 year olds that this graph represents, had lower levels of life satisfaction than the younger 10 year old age group. Um, next slide, please, Sean. So it's not just the individual questions that can shed light on well-being, which um, I mean, often we think about individual questions and they can be important, but actually what we can do is combine individual questions to, um, to understand well-being within what we would might think of a specific domain. And so an example of this is, is this here, this subjective well-being scale, and it's taken from um, a psychological measure that was that was student, it's a student life satisfaction so, um, scale. So it's specifically for children in school or in education. And it's a it's a collection of uh, measures then. So it's these five items that I've listed on the slide. I enjoy my life. My life is going well. I have a good life. The things that happen in my life are excellent and I'm happy with my life. And again, the children answered this along this naught to 10 scale, but then that's transformed into into an, like an overall measure that summarizes the responses to these five items. So if we could have the next slide, please. So again, um, we see that Wales is quite low down um, in, in the list of countries. Again, it's, it's 25th out of 30 um, response, uh, countries that responded to this question. Um, so the children, again, it's, this is 12 year olds. Um, and we can see that it's got, with, the, with that bar going to the left, it's, it's, we've got significantly lower than average scores. Um, and again, this is, so this is the findings for the older age group. And then, so within Wales, these 12 year olds have lower scores than the 10 year olds. And then just the next slide, please. So this is the final um, slide on these international comparisons. Um, and this is, this is a, is a slightly, again, it's a scale, it's a slightly different way of thinking about subjective well-being. And, and here we're thinking about psychological well-being. Um, so these are questions about the self, really. Um, and so again, this is consisting of several items, it's six items this time. So I like being the way I am. I'm good at managing my daily responsibilities. People are generally friendly towards me. I have enough choice about how I spend my time. I feel I'm learning a lot at the moment and I feel positive about the future. And, and again, they responded along a zero to 10 scale, which was transformed into an overall summary statistic. Um, and the next slide, please, for the results. And this is probably um, the most kind of headline grabbing um, of all of the, all of the uh, measures of subjective well-being that were in the children's worlds in terms of Wales position. Um, so the children in Wales just reporting much lower um, levels of psychological well-being compared to all of the other um, countries as well as the average um, and actually returned lower scores for two of the five items in the scale. So I like being the way I am and I feel positive about my future. And um, they were very low for children in Wales. And so the next slide, please. So there's a quite a lot of writing on this slide in an attempt to highlight and summarize broader findings from the international comparisons and where the well-being of children in Wales sits. So broadly speaking, 
The international comparisons show us that 10 and 12 year olds in Wales tend to report lower than average levels of well-being across all the measures, but that these differences tend to be statistically significant for 12 year olds. Um, and low well-being in Wales is particularly pronounced in the psychological well-being of 12 year olds, as we just saw. Um, I only presented the 12 year old comparisons here, but it, it might be interesting to note that um, 10 year olds in Wales don't report significantly different well-being to those in England. Um, England didn't um, conduct the survey with 12 year olds, so we don't have those direct comparisons. Um, uh, and then another point to raise is across the majority of countries and items, 12 year olds tend to report lower levels of well-being than 10 year olds. Um, so generally speaking, not all countries, is that true? Um, but it is particularly pronounced in a number of countries, including Wales. And then lastly, the other analysis shows that Wales distribution of subjective well-being scores is wider than other countries. So there seems to be more variation within Wales when it comes to levels of well-being. And that well-being scores are better explained by child-centred measures of material deprivation compared to other European countries, at least which is interesting as it indicates that experienced or perceived inequalities potentially driving some of those low well-being scores that we saw. And it's, and it's surprising as well because other measures um, of material deprivation and poverty would suggest that Wales is much more homogenous than that, but actually it's more equal than European countries. Um, so overall then, it appears, it appears we've got two things going on. So we've got between country differences and within country differences. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. So when we think about between country variations or differences, the strength of relationship between country level factors and subjective well-being has been found to be actually quite weak. Um, apart from that, so the social support and relationships, um, as reported by adults, are found to be significantly associated to child reported subjective well-being. So it's exactly what Colette was saying earlier. Um, that, that it's, it's about social support and relationships. That seems to be um, part of when we're looking at those between country differences. Um, but when we turn to differences within individual countries, so when we're looking at that variation, so in Wales, when we're looking at that wide variation and um, the spread of scores, um, we see that there's more, so we see that there's more variation within the countries but the explanations to this variation differs between countries. So there's different reasons why subjective well-being might be different for different children within a particular country. Um, so although those explanations differ, there are generally two factors that remain important to children's subjective well-being across different countries. And the first of these is the quality of relationship with others, including family, friends, teachers. And then the perception that adults respect children's rights is also very important. Um, and other work that I'm doing is looking at that. Um, but it is that highlighted point, that quality of relationship with others that leads us to the work that Colette and I have been doing to a certain extent. And so along with a number of questions around subjective well-being, um, the Children's World Survey included questions on children's interpersonal relationships, their home life and family circumstances. So importantly for our shared interests, um, as Colette said, that included a question on uh, living arrangements and what type of home they lived in. And so once we'd, once we'd cleaned up the data and, and had a look at what questions had been answered by what children, because remember they could skip questions if they didn't want to answer them, um, we found that there were 22, 22 children, so just less than 1% of the sample, who indicated that they lived in a foster home within our Welsh sample. So given that we have this information and the fact that we have the range of questions on subjective well-being that we could explore, we set out to see if there was um, any differences really but in reported subjective well-being between those in and not in foster care. So if I could have the next slide, please. And so um, as was indicated with the long list of topics that I talked about earlier, there's, uh, there's a large range of individual indicators and several well-being in, uh, scales that we could have looked at differences for. So we were operating under the assumption that there may be differences in, in, in any of those in terms of well-being between those experiencing and not experiencing this type of care. We just tested a, a, a range of indicators and measures to examine where the differences might lie. And so... Um, using t-test for unequal samples for those that are interested in the statsy bit of it. Um, we indicate, we identified the indicators and two scales visualized on this slide. I'm sorry, um, 
uh, along the bottom you can't you can't really see but I'll say in order what what those um what the access labels are um but the the differences here are the statistically significant differences between the two groups so we've got the non-foster kids in in blue and then um foster children in orange and so all of these again um uh, were measured or calculated to sit in the case of the two scales along the zero to 10 Likert type agreement scale um, with zero being equivalent to don't agree and 10 equivalent to totally agree. And so whilst we're not assuming that the very small subsample of foster children is representative of the wider foster child population, these simple comparisons do suggest that there are important differences between the two groups. And so going along the bottom um, then in order, uh, we found that on average, children in foster care report lower scores in terms of satisfaction with other family, so those they, they don't live with, having a good life, satisfaction with their own safety, enjoying life, people that they live with, the subjective well-being scale, and agreeing that life is going well. Um, and that they report higher scores, so in, it's a it's a reversed uh, relationship really with these last two, but um, higher scores in terms of negative affect scale and feeling stressed in the last two weeks. There is one thing with this though, is that whilst um, these differences appear like they could be plausible, right? We could, we could think about explanations for these. It's important to note that the two groups might have other underlying differences in the characteristics, and it might be those underlying characteristics that are driving these results which brings us on to our next slide, please. Where, so we examined the characteristics of the two subsamples on three key variables. So we had a limited number of demographic and socioeconomic characteristics collected in the survey. And although, so these three characteristics, although they give a somewhat mixed picture in the literature, um, age, gender and material deprivation do stand out both in the literature and our own analysis of the whole whale sample as being um, characteristics that have distinctly differing levels of and also being important to the measurement of children's subjective well-being. So in order of presentation on the slide, we included age, whereby older children tend to have lower levels of subjective well-being, gender, where it's more nuanced, but overall girls tend to report lower levels of subjective well-being, and material deprivation as a measurement of sustained poverty. Um, with research evidence in an inverse relationship with well-being. And so just as a point of interest, the scale here was developed by the International um, Children's Wills team with children asked if they were missing any of the AI items listed in that box. So good clothes, money for school trips, et cetera, um, which was then transformed into a binary variable. So if they were missing two or more items, they were considered materially deprived. So, and then the table just shows the differences between our foster and non-foster groups and we find relatively similar gender split as we might expect but that the foster children tended to be older and notably more deprived. We have the next slide please. And so this slide is a bit technical and if it's not your bag then just feel free to switch off for a minute I'm only going to take a minute to go over it um, and I'll get to the results very soon but given the very small number of children experiencing foster care in our sample and in order to account for the differences in material deprivation as well as other confounding variables. We took a counterfactual approach to perform matched analyses. So we use this framework to estimate the effect that being in foster care had on subjective wellbeing outcomes. Um, to allow us to compare children as similar as possible, the participants were essentially matched on their age, gender, and the material deprivation measure, which produced um, up, uh, at least three or up to over 700 non-foster matches for each child in care. So we're matching up those foster children with similar non-foster children essentially. Um, in this approach then, the effect of foster care on subjective well-being is conceptualized as a missing data problem, essentially calculating the potential outcomes for each child if the converse of their foster care status were true. Um, essentially, the average difference between the observed and potential outcomes for each child is calculated. So in other words, <laughs> trying to explain it three ways, um, the difference between subjective well-being scores if all children were in foster care is compared to if none of the children were. And so when we do that, um, that's the next slide. This is my final slide then. Um, thank you. 
So using this approach, we can, we're essentially, we can be more confident with the results that the, the differences that we're finding now are actually due to the effects of foster care. And so we find fewer, but arguably really interesting differences than when we're um, using just those simple comparisons that I presented on that graph. So the effect of being in foster care appear to decrease children's happiness with other people in their family and about how that's safe they feel. Um, and these are perhaps unsurprising. Uh, the very nature of children being in foster care indicates that there might be problematic and strained relationships with the family they don't live with. But perhaps more surprising then is the, is the last two points here, is that the effect of being in foster care appeared to increase children's positivity about the future and the friendliness of others. And whilst I could speculate about why this might be the case, um, what this data really uh, highlights to me is the opportunity and need to explore this further um, and the opportunity for the qualitative data to support survey findings, um, at which point I'm going to hand over to Colette because this is her, her field, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jen. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, from what we've heard from Jen, really the results from the Wales Children's World Study does suggest important differences in aspects of subjective well-being of children in foster care and children in the general population in the sample. The limitations are obviously the small incidental sample of foster children uh, in that survey and the fact that it's very hard to draw any real conclusions about the children's understanding regarding these issues from the survey results alone. The complementary children's understanding of well-being studies attempt to bring that greater depth of understanding from the detailed descriptions provided through direct interviews with the children. So let's look now at an example of the children's understanding of well-being studies. I also note the time, Donald, in that uh, I might need to be going over um, yeah. and, and a bit of time for this because uh, I'm only starting this at this point. So the English study was part of the multinational children's understand the well-being study taking place in 30 plus uh, countries. The aim of the English study was to explore 11 year old children's understanding of well-being and we used purpose of snowball sampling to gather the sample. Four schools um, were selected to be in areas of varying levels of were selected to uh, uh, were selected and they were in areas of varying levels of deprivation and ethnic diversity. Uh, 92 11 year old children attending the four schools took part uh, with 50 females, 42 males, 50 white British and 39 from different ethnic origins and th with three unconfirmed. Uh, parents consent and child assent were obtained for all child participation in the research and the English study was funded by the Health Foundation in London. I'm racing over this very general material to get to the detail. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? All 92 children participated in three interviews uh, following a protocol created by Toby Fattori and colleagues uh, um, who are behind the Children's Understanding of Wellbeing uh, project, and that, that we followed the protocol to allow cross-country comparison. So in stage one, all children were asked to complete uh, a well -be a child well-being map of the people, places and things in their everyday lives which were of importance to them. They were then interviewed individually about its content and why people were important, people and things uh, and places were important to them. And those interviews were recorded with the children's permission. In stage two, the children took part in focus group discussions about the important general issues raised by children to date, and that would have been in this study, but also in the previous Children's World study. So big issues such as when you feel safe, when you feel secure, um, uh, relationships with the families were all discussed in this. And in stage three, the children created short films about their lives in England, uh, to share with children in other countries in the study. And in the English study, we um, took a different departure. We used avatars uh, created by the children to ensure their anonymity. Next slide, please. All of the children responded well to the participatory approach. They were eager to complete the well-being maps, depicting pl people, places, activities, and things important in their everyday lives, and exercised considerable agency on how they chose to complete the task. We, interestingly, we had particularly asked them about the people, places and things that were important in their everyday life based on uh, earlier literature, 
but it, all of the children brought activities in as important to them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that was later on. Um, they very interestingly, what we were trying to capture was the reasoning behind children choosing certain things as important to them in their daily lives. And what we wanted to know is whether 11 year old children could give us some detailed rationalizations. And this is just to say that that was very successful. Um, however, the, in, with the maps and also with uh, very, very um, successful with the maps, when we came to the focus group interviews, um, there was some useful information, but the children didn't enjoy the task. They found it too complex and less enjoyable. Um, but the final part, making the films, was a terrific success and a great motivator for the children to, to participate. And I'll explain more about that. So in terms of important places, things, activities um, and why, here's, here's some examples here. The family um, were important to them because um, consistent love and affection, constant support, encouragement and protection, fun to be with. And, grand, and the significance of grandparents. Um, the friends, it was about, again, support, trust and protection, um, uh, people to play and have fun with. Now, there were some differences in children's responses regarding the importance of grandparents and friends. Um, but, uh, and this was more frequently uh, reported in high deprivation areas. But of course, availability and proximity appeared to be pertinent factors, and I'll expand on that. Important places and why, um, the children's own homes, their bedrooms, uh, their grandparents' houses, family holidays were frequently mentioned. Homes were associated with feeling safe. Bedrooms offered privacy, feeling safe from outside pressures and a place to relax. Grandparents' houses were associated with positive nurturing relationships with grandparents. According to the children, it was the relationships, not places, which were of importance. In terms of important activities and why it was associated, the activities were associated with enjoyment, achievement, companionship. That was very often after schools activities, sports, uh, learning a piano, learning a new skill, all sorts of things like that. Um, most took place with family, friends or peers, but some on their own, such as reading art or listening to music or learning an instrument. All of the children um, added these to their well-being map without any prompting from us. And it's really important the way we conducted these interviews, we asked them only what was important to them in terms of people, places and things. And uh, uh, we didn't ask them for activities, they added it in. And we had absolutely, the interviewers, my team, were not allowed to uh, in any way prompt them. So this, because what was really important to us was not to impose adult ideas. Uh, it was to get, generate entirely the thoughts of children. Uh, now, important things and why, uh, very often they, uh, they weren't important in themselves, but rather in relation to activities and relationships. Children in the least deprived area mentioned things more, which could be related to more finance available to buy things. But often those children in the least deprived areas uh, were more on their own due to having less siblings or having extended family nearby. So that could be connected as well. Relationships were, uh, our overall finding was that relationships were center of the children's sense of well being. Important places were most often associated with relationships. All of the children saw activities as important. Activities appeared to be the medium through which relationships developed or was sustained with family and friends, particularly where children were living where their parents had separated and the children were living with one and visiting the other or co-living with two families as such. That contact with the family in which they weren't immediately living with was absolutely crucial in enriching that relationship and maintaining it. And they were explaining all that. They also stressed the importance of activities for their own skill development. And we hadn't thought about that so much, but they were emphasizing how much they enjoyed learning, constantly trying to find new things they were good at. 
The things, the things most mentioned were of a technical nature, very often their smartphones, at times for their own amusement in their own bedroom as such, but often even when they're in their own bedroom, they were using the phones to set up a time to meet up with family or friends or, or so on. So it was about using the technical to encourage more of the relationships. Of importance for us, was their sense of agency. In other words, they, they were using things in their own time in whatever way they chose. And there was a lot of examples of that. Now, one of the research questions posed for the study was whether the children's responses would differ if they lived in areas with varying levels of deprivation and varying levels of ethnic diversity. And, there, uh, and I do need to say to you, there was a huge contrast between the um, socioeconomic circumstances of the children living in, uh, in some of the schools from some of the others in the more deprived areas, marked differences. And there were marked differences in some of the responses and the context in which children uh, experience daily life different considerably in terms of the level of poverty and the extent of ethnic diversity. Some differences might be related to one or an interplay of both of these factors. And close examination of the lived experiences and context provided useful, uh, proved useful in understanding the basis of these differences. Now, when we come to examining the individual responses, it was clear that extended families were more likely to live nearby in poorer areas and were a source of support and childcare in many cases. And this was irrespective of variations in ethnic diversity. In the low deprivation area, families often moved there due to parents' occupations and extended families frequently far away or abroad. So children's daily lived experiences with grandparents were different due to the availability for daily or regular contact activities or care. Cultural and religious differences appeared in children's reported daily activities. For example, Muslim children, irrespective of deprivation level, indicated that they usually attended mosques daily after school for prayers for around 90 minutes. White English children in the least deprived areas attended structured after school activities such as sports, music, etc. White English children in the deprived areas had few structured after school activities but visited relatives or had free play with friends nearby. A further notable difference was that South Asian children's sense of family in the most deprived area extended to those remaining in the country from which their families had migrated several generations earlier. Their concept of family was quite different. They, were, they also conveyed a picture of extended family support and being, close, uh, being part of a close-knit, knit, self-contained South Asian community. Just some, I wanted to end this section with some quotes from the children. Um, I love my mum and dad because they love me and they would do anything for me and I would do anything for them. I love my family, my brothers and two sisters. I love my grandma. I see her every day. When I get back from school, no one is there to take me. So I go to my grandparents' house and my grandma cooks me food. It's usually on holidays. Me and my brother go down with our parents. And so I see my nana and my granddad. And my other grandparents I used to see every two weeks because they come up every two weeks. Next slide. My friends are um, also some of the most important people in my life and they will encourage me to go further in my life and without them I don't know what I would do. And when I'm in trouble they'll stick up for me. When I'm sad they will help me with my problems. My friends are important to me because if someone bullies me they would say why are you bullying her? B and C are my best friends they always be with me and help me with my work. And one uh, comment that should have been the last slide was, uh, my family are more important than places. And I just want to go back before, just before we go to that generous slide, uh, yes. I just want to go back to the point about bullying. Um, I'm obviously doing a very broad overview and I can um, uh, uh, share the report and the publications with you. But we discovered that in terms of children's sense of agency, um, they recognised that they could well be bullied. And there was many examples of how children strategically decided that if they could have a number of good friends around them, there would be much less chance that anyone could bully them properly. And, I, and that was very, very interesting how they had thought through the importance of friendship to keep them safe in a school environment. 
Okay, can go on to the next slide, please. So just when we're drawing this together, because we have two studies here together, and I just want to draw out some broad over, overview points. We have the first Children's World uh, Survey completed in Wales on the general population, and some indications of significant differences in well-being between children in the general population and those in care. We have the first children's understanding of well-being study in the UK completed in England on the general population, which has provided rich findings on context and the approach again was well accepted by the children. Internationally, it is recognized that children looked after and in state care are a specialist population, which could and should be included in this work on well-being. So an international group of researchers of which I'm a part, are currently considering how we might sensitively adapt the CUWB approach to do this. And that would permit us for the first time to compare the detailed responses of children in the general population with those living in state care on all aspects of their lives, in school, including their school lives. And generally, learning from wellbeing studies should inform policy and practice in relation to this vulnerable group of children. And since I began working with Cascade, I'm aware that um, you have, uh, unlike many other countries, uh, incorporated the concept of well-being in your legislation in Wales, which is very important. Thank you for, uh, so far for the presentation. I know that uh, Donald has some big broad questions and after that we have the list of references, but it may be that you want to, uh, people may want to raise questions as well about the presentation. I've, I found that absolutely fascinating. I wanted to say a big thank you to Jen and Colette. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think you've sort of got three sets of presentations in one there. So the international comparison at the general level, the specific look in Wales at kids in care, kids not in care, and then the rich qualitative data from England, but which must raise issues about, could we do something similar in Wales? What, we, what might we do, do in Wales? Um, I think it's a tribute to how interesting it was that not a single person left the seminar from beginning to end. Um, so, you know, we can't see people out there, but people can vote their uh, click, clicking out. Um, so it's great to see everyone still here. If you've got a question, you can either type it in the chat and I will read it out, or if you put your hand up, we'll come and unmute you and you can ask it yourself. Um, uh, as no one's asked a question or put their hand up yet, I thought I would um, get us started with one, which is really the, the first one from there, uh, which is uh, to Jen, uh, why you think uh, in Wales children seem to have such poor child well-being generally and particularly psychological well-being maybe. Um, yeah, that's not a tricky question, Donald, thanks. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think there's a number of things going on, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think that we have we have some kind of we have measurement issues when it comes to quantitative surveys of this nature that there has been some work around um, uh, how children in different um, from different countries answer in different ways there's like a culture of responding to questionnaires um, and children within schools in Wales are very practiced at answering questionnaires right they have a lot of we do a lot of research within schools um, that doesn't explain the differences. I think, I think really we need to start with the differences within Wales and work outwards to understand it better. Um, and, and really, I think short of speculation, it's that it's that qualitative work that Colette's doing where we can really begin to begin to see what might be driving the different the differences within the country, but also those international differences. And that's the children's understanding of well-being. That, that big study where they are taking an international approach to understanding it. Um, so really the quantitative work is not answering the why, it's, uh, it's, it's highlighting that those differences exist. Um, yeah, and sorry, so that's up, not, yeah. Uh, you, you set up what I was going to do, which is, is then turn to, turn to Colette and say, um, ha, what contribution might the, the, the qualitative research have to, to help us understand some of these issues? And I just wondered what your thoughts on that are. Uh, well, as I said in the presentation, qualitative offers uh, in-depth understanding and what we were trying to get at was, and it was very, um, when I was training the team of researchers, it was because they came from, uh, they were social work PhD students, they were used to ask 
prompting uh, children about for answers. And they had to be retrained it, for the study not to prompt, to only set the broad guidelines and not in any way to suggest to children what should go on their maps. They weren't allowed to interact with them at all other than provide materials as they were creating and drawing on their maps or any materials or resource. That, and they had to be retrained to do that. Um, and, and so what I'm, I'm getting at is we need to get at children's understanding of well-being. And what we have gradually, as we've understood the importance of subjective well-being, we've realized that we really do need to do qualitative studies to um, make sure to complement the quantitative ones as such. In my mind, if we're thinking about um, for years, I have conducted studies, my even going back to my doctor, were around the emotional and social development of children in care. Very often in uh, social work academic world, we conduct studies of children in care on their own, but not in comparison with children in the general population. So there's a lot of assumptions there about how far our children in special circumstances are different from children in the general population. On the whole, we're using adult views um, about that difference. And why I wanted to come to be a part of Cascade was because it's a leading children's social care center, research center. But I felt that if we could bring this world of energy about children's well-being and the voices of children about their well-being to that center, that we might grow something somewhat different than what has been done traditionally with children in care. Um, we were, and, and in my head, uh, one could take for, and I would love to hear what people think that would be of interest to managers and practitioners in social care in Wales. Um, uh, but it does strike me that it would be very valuable to do a children's subjective well-being study in Wales, but I would really like to know how the children are in the general population or children in troubled families, as well as children who are actually in care. So you can say something substantive, you know, or alternatively, follow children from the point of coming into care prospectively over time to see how their reported well-being changes. There are different ways one could approach it. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking how useful it would be to have that, that longitudinal life course um, study, particularly if it was from near or even before they come into care in an ideal world, um, to see for, for all of us to understand how well-being can change over time and in particular what, what are the key things that influence that so that we can improve well-being. I suppose I'm a bit surprised there aren't lots of questions because I think there's so much in here. Hello, hooray, there's a couple of questions come through and I was just musing about whether it, is it partly because it seems like relatively good news that children in care have relatively good well-being and um, perhaps we were a bit surprised by that in social work, they were so used to bad news. Um, so Elizabeth Bryan has asked a question. In our programme, we make a link between children's well-being and educational attainment. And I wondered if there are any comparisons made between these well-being scores and educa educational attainment or PISA scores on an international level. Or do the panellists not see that as a useful comparison? I have a feeling, Jen, I, I might start with you for this one and then go to Colette for the next one. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think I think it may, it could be a very useful comparison. It's not something that um, I've been working on particularly at the moment. Um, where um, the work that I've been doing, the two the two points that I raised that explain that within country variation, I think I'm more I'm I, I kind of I'm more interested in the within country variation um, as a starting point. Um, and so the work that I've been doing is this work that I'm, I'm doing with Colette, but also um, work that looks at um, the, the place of children's rights within the school setting. And so it's it's been able to tang untangle because subjective well-being is domain specific. It's not a it's not a, a there's good subjective well-being and it's good subjective well-being across the board. Um, and so that then it's it's can try and tease that out that if children have um there's it's a it's a complex interaction i think if children have poor well-being subjective well-being at home does that impact on school and we know that the social the impact of social relationships at home does impact on 
their engagement with and well-being within school. Um, but yeah, it's not something that I've got to yet within the analysis. We're a, we're a very small team looking at the quantitative stuff in Wales. But um, yeah, it's a very it's a very good point and well raised. Yeah, uh, may I, Claire? Of uh, course, yes, Claire. Uh, I just wanted to say, and you maybe picked it up on the slide, that I, if we were to do a subjective study of children, we can pick up a lot about their school lives. And I haven't shared all of that today. Uh, about the data we got from the English study as such. But I suppose I'd be, I, I do certainly think we can do connections with school attainment, but actually what I would be really interested in is the children's views of their well-being in their school lives. In other words, much broader than educational attainment, much, much broader. It could be linked to educational attainment, but I'd be really interested in how the children see different dimensions of the school. And just to say to you, we conducted that study in England through schools and the schools were so interested in uh, being a part of studies like this. And I suspect you would get that perhaps in Wales as well. Um, questions are now coming in, but we just have two minutes left. So I think I'm, I'm gonna take one more um, and um, uh, then we'll probably have to end. So Yena Samuels makes the point that there's a serious lack of cultural understanding within institutions with regards to black and minority ethnic children's culture and the impact or the interaction this can have with their well-being. And that there's an expectation that everyone who comes to this country must do things our way, but uh, that may not be the right way, or well, certainly there are at least as good other ways of doing things. And that may be a particular issue for children in the care system. And I was struck, Colette, that culture and religion and other factors came through quite strongly in your qualitative findings. So I thought I'd start off with you and then Jen may have things to say about that or not. I'm not sure. Well, so. I think that's a very, very good point that's been raised, that we think we know what the issues are for children coming from a different country. But it's when you go down and start and ask the children about their everyday lives and how they're seeing things that you have a much, much deeper understanding. For example, when the children were telling us about how the, why things were important, they drew little mosque and so on, and they went there for, I was surprised, 90 minutes uh, for prayers after school. And if you think about that then, that is such a different life than a child that's going off doing sports or playing or whatever. Uh, it, it's, it tells you a lot more about expectations of children with homework and different things like that. All the responsibilities, different children, different cultures, different way of doing things, but it gives you a better insight into how their school and the rest of their lives combine. Um, and I don't think I had that knowledge before, even though I have been working in Bradford and in that multicultural society for several years. Yeah. And, and Jen, I'm, I'm not sure if it's something that came up in the study you did or not, but as we, it's one o'clock, but I, if it didn't, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, it's not, I, um, it's, a, I, it's a really um, important point. And I think it's, it's something that we, we, um, can be tempted to overlook when we're looking at it in the kind of national level um but it but it's not something that i can comment on on the data that i've looked at so yeah. um i i'm we, we've run out of time partly because i think there was so much uh, richness uh, in there so um I think we're going to stop the presentation because people donald can i can i ask you something can we save the the questions on chat yes. and can we also say to anyone who would like to be in touch with us that maybe we could share our emails or something if they want to follow yeah. through the conversation. Very good. So in about a week, we will share the slides, uh, the recording, and uh, we can also share contact details, um, certainly for Claire and for Jen, if she's happy, so that if people have questions that come up or, or collaborations they want, we can follow that up. Um, but I just now like to thank uh, Jen and Colette for just a, a great, rich, um, and wonderful seminar. I'm sure everyone would be joining me in that if that was possible. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you everyone for attending and attending all the way through. Everyone stayed right to the end, which I think is the, the key test really.